The Enterprise has some time before they have to rendezvous with a ship to deliver some medical supplies, so they decide to investigate a quasar in the area. Spock takes a science team of six in the shuttlecraft Galileo, but the quasar makes their instruments go cuckoo, and the Galileo crash lands on a nearby planet. Spock has to use all of his skills of logic to help the team to repair the shuttlecraft, while at the same time trying to survive attacks from the local indigenous murder monkey population. Let's find out if he has what it takes to save the lives of the Galileo 7. Hit it! Got a few guest stars in this one, starting with John Crawford playing High Commissioner Ferris. He did a lot of film and television, including guest spots on sci-fi shows like My Favorite Martian, Time Tunnel, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, and Lost in Space. He also appeared in The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit with DeForest Kelly and the hilariously named Zombies of the Stratosphere with Lyndon Nimoy. Don Marshall plays your Lieutenant Boma. He was all over the place, appearing in the likes of the Alfred Hitchcock Hour, Bewitched, Doctari, and three episodes of The Incredible Hulk. They liked the character of Boma enough that they wanted to hire him on as a series regular, but by the time they made the offer, he had already been cast as a lead in Land of the Giants, where he shot 51 episodes. Next, you got Peter Marco as Lieutenant Gaetano. He didn't do too much acting, but did show up in The Outer Limits, The Fugitive, Hogan's Heroes, and Mission Impossible. Phyllis Douglas appears as Yeoman Mears, a role that was originally supposed to be Yeoman Janice Rand, but that didn't work out for obvious reasons, see last episode. She didn't do too much acting past the 60s, but she started her career at the age of two as Bonnie Blue Butler in Gone with the Wind. She was also in a couple of episodes of Batman, Medical Center, and will show up one more time on Star Trek, but as a different character. Last but not least, you got Robert Big Buck Maffey as all of the murder monkeys. This seven foot one behemoth played the giant Cyclops in Lost in Space, Andex the Giant in Atlantis the Lost Continent alongside the aforementioned Phyllis Douglas, and even did some voice work in the Rankin Bass animated Lord of the Rings. Now, I can't find who he voiced, but I really hope it was a hobbit, you know? Anyways, let's get into the plot. The Enterprise rolls up on Murasaki 312, a quasar, or at least a quasar-like phenomenon. And Spock's got a shuttlecraft full of eggheads ready to go on a field trip to study it. Up on the bridge, though, one Galactic High Commissioner Ferris shows up to remind Kirk that they're supposed to meet a ship in five days to deliver some medical supplies that are bound for the new Paris colonies who are experiencing a plague. Kirk says they're only three days away from the rendezvous point, and since they have these two extra days, and since he's got standing orders to explore and investigate quasars or quasar-like phenomena, he's going to let Spock take the kids out in a minivan and take a look. The shuttlecraft Galileo takes off to go quasar probing, but the quasar has different plans. The electrical interference coming from the quasar-like phenomenon knocks the Galileo off course and out of control, and Spock sends a distress call to the Enterprise. Uhura can just make out that they're off course and that's it. The quasar is goofing with the Enterprise's sensors too, and they can't use them to find the shuttle. There are four stellar systems in the vicinity, so finding the shuttle, if it still is even out there, is going to be almost impossible. Cut to Taurus 2, where Spock has managed to safely crash the Galileo. He puts Scotty to repair in the shuttle, and the rest head outside. Spock sends Lieutenants Latimer and Gaetano out to scout the area while he inspects the exterior for more damage. Cut to the Enterprise Bridge, where Uhura has spotted the only Class M planet, meaning it has the atmosphere and whatnot to support human and or Vulcan life, and Kirk tells Sulu to set course. The transporters ain't working, because Quasar, so he launches the shuttlecraft Columbus to search the planet's surface. High Commissioner Jerkface over here starts talking about, I didn't want you to do this in the first place, and you're never ever gonna find them, and I'm a prize-winning jackass in a jacket with little flappy things on my arms and all this. And right before Kirk decides to Kirk chop this scumbag, we cut back to the planet. Scotty says that the shuttle is actually in pretty good condition, but the problem is they lost a lot of fuel in the crash. 
so much that they can't get off the planet unless they shed at least 500 pounds. Which Spock notes is about the same as three grown adults in that he's going to have to channel a little Kodos the Executioner to make the decision about who stays and who goes. Lieutenant Boma wants to draw straws about it. Spock says it makes way more sense to come to a logical decision than leaving it up to random chance. And Boma tells Spock his opinion of logic. Well, it's about this time that our scouting party starts hearing a weird noise coming from the fog all around them. Then they spot a giant monkey with a spear. It's a giant murder monkey. The murder monkey throws the spear at Latimer and it nails him in the back, killing him instantly. Gaetano gets freaked out by that, but is only able to shoot his phaser blindly into the fog. It seems to have scared the murder monkeys off for now, and Spock and Boma show up because they heard the ruckus. Spock notes that the spearhead looks a lot like the Folsom Point, and that means the murder monkeys don't got a very high technology level. Boma and Gaetano get a little bit out of shape that Latimer is dead and Spock is writing an archaeology paper over here. Spock is like, what am I supposed to do, cry? Is that going to bring the human pincushion over there back to life? No? Well, then grab Sir William Backspear over there and let's get back to the shuttle, all right? Well, back on the Enterprise, Kirk is feeling the pressure of the looming deadline. The Quasar is still goofing with the transporters, so he tells the shuttle Columbus to widen their search pattern, to try to speed up the search. Sulu says that's going to leave gaps. Kirk says, I'm about to leave gaps in you, Lieutenant, who asked you. Will you just drive the ship? I'm getting desperate over here. Well, back on the planet, Spock and Scotty are trying to fix something in the floor, and the fuel line pops, and the rest of their fuel leaks out like a DeLorean in a desert cave. Spock tells Scotty to get to work on an alternative, because there are always alternatives, and Scotty is like, oh, yeah, I forgot I'm friggin' Thistledore the Scottish wizard over here. Well, about that time, the weird noises that Gaetano and Latimer heard are back. Spock says it sounds like wood scraping on leather. Okay, sure, why not? Boma says that might be an indication of a tribal thing with the murder monkeys, so if they pop one really good, maybe even grease one of them, they'll tell their buddies and they'll leave us alone. Spock says that makes sense, but he don't want to kill or even hurt the murder monkeys if he can avoid it. So they're going to fire to frighten, not to kill. He sends McCoy and Yeoman Mears back to the ship, and Spock, Boma, and Gaetano go to scare the murder monkeys. It seems to work, and Spock puts Gaetano on guard, and he and Boma head back. You already see where this is going, right? When Spock gets back, Scotty says he's worked out a way to fuel the shuttle using the energy from the phases. Unfortunately, they're the only thing keeping the murder monkeys away. But getting off the planet is more important, so Spock orders everyone to give Scotty their phases, and he gets to work. Back on the Enterprise, the transporters are working now, so they start sending search parties down to the planet. Remember Gaetano? Well, a murder monkey murders him. I know. Surprise, surprise. Spock, Boma, and McCoy show up to where they heard Gaetano screaming, but they only find his phaser on the ground. Spock gives it to Boma and tells him to head back to the shuttle. He'll go and find Gaetano. Boma objects, and Spock hands him his own phaser as well to give to Scotty and goes off on his dead guy hunt. He finds Gaetano's body, and as he's carrying him away, he apparently cheeses off every murder monkey in the Tri-County area. Spears are flying every which way, there's lots of roaring and growling, very bad. Spock jumps in the shuttle with everyone else, and the murder monkeys start beating on the shuttle with giant rocks. Well, while this is going on, Spock is, uh, having a moment. He's perplexed that he's made all the correct logical decisions, and yet two people are dead. The murder monkeys saw they had cool laser guns, and yet they weren't scared of them. And he's managed to honk off his whole team. Well, everyone except Scotty, who apparently is the only one who knows how to shut up and do his job. Speaking of Scotty, he says it's going to be another hour before he's finished draining the phases into the shuttle. But Spock don't think the shuttle can withstand the rock pounding for an hour, so he asks if the shuttle's batteries are charged enough to electrify the outer hull of the shuttle. Scotty likes that idea, and he goes and does it. Seems to do the trick, and the murder monkeys run off. Then, Boma starts wanting to plan a funeral for Latimer and Gaetano, because, hey, there's time to dig holes and arrange catering and stuff, right? It ain't like time is of the essence or nothing. Well, back on the Enterprise, some of the search parties are coming back with murder monkey spears in them. And Countdown Curtis over here tells Kirk his time is up, and he's assuming command according to yada yada yada. Well, Kirk calls the search parties back and tells the Columbus to come back to the barn. On the planet, Scotty has finished transferring all the phases' energy into the Galileo. He says the ship will be ready to go in eight minutes. 
Spock tells McCoy and Boma they have exactly that amount of time to bury Latimer and Gaetano. Eight minutes ain't a lot of time to bury two guys, so Spock will chip in. Well, the Enterprise breaks orbit and slow rolls their exit, keeping the sensors pointed back at Taurus too. The funeral service is crashed by the murder monkeys and everybody has to run back to the shuttle. Spock gets pinned under a rock thrown by the murder monkeys and despite his protests that they should leave him and take off, McCoy and Boma get him freed and they make it back to the Galileo. The murder monkeys try to hold the Galileo down and keep it from taking off and Spock has to hit the boosters to get out of there. They escape, but since they used up so much fuel using the boosters, they're not going to be able to soft land once the fuel runs out. If they don't get rescued, they're going to burn up on re-entry. Well, they make it into orbit, and Scotty says they have about 45 minutes before their toast. Spock says they probably screwed everybody by going back for him. Scotty reminds Spock that he said that there were always alternatives. Spock says, yeah, we'll alternate this, and he hits the fuel jettison button. There's your alternative. The rest kind of freak out about it, but as the fuel squirts out, it ignites, making a big glowing trail behind the shuttle. Scotty is impressed, saying it's like sending up a flare. Whether Spock intended to do that, or if he was just trying to cut down on the amount of time he had to listen to everybody bitching about everything before burning up, he keeps that to himself. Well, Sulu sees the trail of burning fuel and points it out to Kirk, who busts a Yui to go and beam up the Galileo crew. They get them in safe, and the Enterprise heads on to drop off those medical supplies. In the epilogue, Kirk points out that the decision to jettison the fuel was one of desperation, which is an emotional response. Spock says, cram it, it worked. Kirk says, you're stubborn. Spock says, your mother. And everyone laughs for like 10 minutes. Roll credits. Great stuff. Spock don't put up with much in this episode, leading to some great exchanges. I realize that command does have its fascinations, even under circumstances such as these. But I neither enjoy the idea of command, nor am I frightened of it. It simply exists. How Spock views the subject of command is something we'll see come up a few more times during the season and on into the movies. But this is the first time it really gets addressed. I can't believe you're serious about leaving someone behind. Now, whatever it is out there that we... It is more rational to sacrifice one life than six, Doctor. I'm not talking about rationality. You might be wise to start. Now we're going to get more into what I think about this whole schism between Spock and the humans in this episode, but Spock's ability to almost offhandedly bring the attitude is always entertaining. Consider the alternatives, Mr. Scott. We have no fuel. What alternatives? Mr. Scott, there are always alternatives. Mr. Spock! A quintessential Spock line. This is, of course, a philosophy that Spock will espouse for the rest of the life of the character. Seems logical to me also to take life indiscriminately. The majority. I'm not interested in the opinion of the majority, Mr. Gatano. The components must be weighed. Our dangers to ourselves as well as our duties to other life forms, friendly or not. Directly ahead of us. Several, I believe. You direct your phases to 2 o'clock and to 10 o'clock. I say we hit them dead on. Yes, I know, but fortunately I'm giving the orders. Take aim, please, and fire when I give a signal. A Spock twofer here reminding the others in the team that Starfleet is not a democracy. We already got Kirk's opinion on the matter back in Corbomite Maneuver. Spock clearly shares the same opinion. Again, more on this later, believe me. Mr. Spock, you said a while ago that there were always alternatives. Did I? I may have been mistaken. Well, at least I lived long enough to hear that. Another of McCoy's great lines poking at Spock. The contention between these two is always fun. The goof. Okay, let's start with this ending. Are you kidding me with this? The big laugh freeze frame was big around this time in television. Somebody would have some quippy remark at the end of an episode of something and everybody would laugh and they'd freeze the frame and put the credits on top of that. Well, they don't do the freeze frame at the end thing on Star Trek, but it feels like the director wanted that kind of feel anyways, so he just had everyone laugh for, like, an implausible amount of time. And everybody's laughter is so insincere and awkward. It feels like the director told everybody to hold the laugh and and just kept the camera rolling to see how long they would do it before they told him to go f*** himself. And all this after at least three of the Enterprise crew just got killed with spears. 
Everybody having a good laugh? Don't you got some letters to write, Captain Jolly Pants? Okay, so see if you can spot the problem with this exchange. Captain, transporter room just beamed up five persons. Alive and well. Mr. Sulu, proceed on course to Marcus 3. Uhura tells the captain they got five people off of the Galileo, and Kirk goes, great, let's get out of here. Now, Euclid I am not, but I do know you don't go from seven to five without subtracting two. Now, Kirk don't seem too put out by the fact that five don't equal seven, especially considering he don't know which two got subtracted. He's just like, whatever, close enough, let's roll. Really? Nothing? I know these guys had lots of things to contend with concerning budget and shooting on a soundstage and whatnot, but this is some amateur dramatic stuff here with Nimoy doing his best to make that half-pound chunk of styrofoam look like it's pinning a Vulcan and holding him helpless. Look at that. I get contact embarrassment just watching that. So, let's talk murder monkey. These things go from big enough to throw 12-foot spears to just a couple of feet taller than Gaetano, to twice as tall as a shuttle. And you can see the grain on their, well, let's be honest, his fur coat thing. If it was all going the same direction, you probably wouldn't notice it, but the middle part being horizontal like that screams that we bought this stuff at whatever the 60s equivalent of Hobby Lobby is. And finally, something you don't usually see, check out the job title of old George Rudder down there. What in the hell is a script supervisor? The irony of the word script being misspelled is really pretty funny. I hope some poor schmo didn't lose his job over that. Production. Okay, so there's so much stuff to talk about concerning the production of this episode. This is like an ad hoc segment where all that's gonna go. There's not always enough to do this, but this episode had a lot of interesting things going on. First, a quick interesting note about the uh, Skpipped. It was written by Oliver Crawford, who was formerly blacklisted during the whole scumbag McCarthy House on american Activities Committee thing. He based it on Five Came Back, which was a 1939 movie starring, among others, Lucille Ball in a dramatic role. Where the passengers and crew of an airplane go off course in a storm and crash on an uncharted island. Things go pretty much the same way, with the murder monkeys being replaced with native islanders. Now, I haven't seen the movie, but I'm sure the natives were portrayed with all of the cultural sensitivity we've come to expect from the 1930s, right? Yeesh. Also, I bring up Lucille Ball because she's really Star Trek's godmother. I may do a video about this at some point, but you really ought to look up just how thoroughly Star Trek owes its existence to Lucy. But, I digress. Now, I didn't put this in the goof section because it wasn't really Star Trek's fault, but you might have noticed a weird and not terribly successful post-production fog effect right after Latimer was murder monkeyed. Well, the reason for that was that the sight of Latimer face down with a murder monkey spear sticking out of his back was apparently a little too much for the censors over at NBC, so they worked out this way to cover him up. I mean, by today's standards, you might see worse than even a network sitcom, but I guess it was pretty gruesome for a 1967 audience. Another thing they couldn't show was the face of the murder monkeys. That one I don't get as much. It's just kind of an ugly dude. My uncle looks worse than that and he don't get a second glance at the unemployment office. Censorship is weird. Okay, so let's talk about that shuttlecraft. One of the things that was really holding up any story that would involve a shuttlecraft was just how much it was going to cost to build it. You need an exterior, an interior, and then a miniature as well so that they could do the effects shots. Well, at this point, NBC's order was only for 16 episodes, with no guarantee that it would get the rest of the season, much less any more seasons after that. So the shuttle set was just too expensive with the future of the show so uncertain. But you know how you hear of these times when someone has a brilliant idea that nobody's done before that ends up making a millions? Bill Gates coming up with licensing DOS rather than selling it to IBM outright. 
George Lucas snatching up the merchandising rights to Star Wars, which the studio didn't give a rat's ass about? Well, into model kit manufacturer AMT. They found out that the show needed a shuttlecraft set and agreed to cover the construction of all of it, interior, exterior, effects miniature, completely free of charge. In exchange, they wanted the exclusive license to produce official models of the ships of Star Trek. Not just the shuttle, but the Enterprise and any other ships they ended up coming up with. The Galileo sets cost a grand total of around $24,1966 to build which would be close to a quarter million today. Now, I can't find a figure on how much AMT made off of Star Trek models, and the company got bought about half a dozen times over the years, but there are still Star Trek models being produced under the AMT brand today, including this version of the Enterprise D that was released in 2024. So I think it's safe to say they've made their money back a few times over on that. Now, paralleling Spock's first shot at command, this episode marks Leonard Nimoy's first shot at being the primary lead actor. Up to this point, he had based all of his characterization for Spock around his role as first officer of the ship. He plays off Shatner's energy, taking the role of advisor, commentator, that kind of thing. But now he's in the spotlight, and Nimoy found that a really hard thing to do. Just like Spock was finding it difficult to tackle command using only the logic that had served him well in the second-in-command capacity, Nimoy was very much experiencing the same thing. It's unfortunate that Nimoy ended up considering the job he did on this episode, in his words, a failure because of that. But for my money, I think those doubts and misgivings really helped to bring forward that same awkwardness with a new role that Spock was experiencing. But I also know there was probably no telling him that. No one criticizes an actor more harshly than the actor themselves, am I right? Ruminations. So right off the bat, let's talk about Gaetano, Boma, and even McCoy's attitude towards Spock during this whole ordeal. I gotta tell you, this is the episode I get the most mad at. And it's for story reasons, so it ain't a bad thing. But based on their behavior... Honestly, Boma and McCoy should be brought up on charges and court-martialed for insubordination and drummed out of Starfleet, with Gaetano only escaping because he got murder monkeyed. Boma and Gaetano level some seriously racist vitriol at Spock that rivals anything that jackass Styles did in Balance of Terror, and McCoy never steps in to back Spock up, which we just saw him do in the last episode, and to Kirk no less. But no, instead he undermines Spock's authority by making comments against Spock to Boma and Gaetano. He's got a unique position of authority on the Enterprise. Scotty is technically the third in command, but McCoy is definitely part of the C-suite, and as such, his word carries much more weight with the rank and file. So when he joins in on the disgruntled grumblings, he's enabling their behavior. Scotty is the only one behaving like a professional, and while I think he waited a little long to step in and shut these assholes down, he does seem to be the only one for whom two stripes on your sleeve actually mean something. And it ain't like Spock was given immoral or incompetent orders. In fact, one could argue that Gaetano's death is a direct result of Spock caving to his and Boma's demand that they go out and confront the murder monkeys. It was Spock's decision not to kill the murder monkeys, but there's no indication that anything would have been any different if they had. Like McCoy says, they reacted emotionally, with anger. If anything, it's more likely their response would have been even more violent if they had killed one of them. And the whole let's have a funeral thing is objectively stupid as hell. Now it sucks that they got murder monkeyed. But taking the time to bury these guys and stand around, quote, saying a few words while the same murder monkeys that greased these two are still, like, right over there is about the dumbest thing ever. Honestly, if it wasn't for Scotty, this could have easily crossed the line into mutiny territory. And the fact that McCoy was even the slightest bit a part of it is pretty disappointing. Now, if you're shocked that your possum here is this cheesed off by military insubordination and flagrant disregard for the chain of command, you just wait until you hear what I think about Captain Jellico. That's going to be fun. (laughs) So all of that aside, let's talk about this line right here. Well, Mr. Spock, they didn't stay frightened very long, did they? Most illogical reaction. When we demonstrated our superior weapons, they should have fled. You mean they should have respected us? Of course. Mr. Spock, respect is a rational process. Did it ever occur to you they might react emotionally? With anger? 
Doctor, I'm not responsible for their unpredictability. They were perfectly predictable. So this episode first aired on January 5th, 1967. For historical context, there was this other thing going on at the time over in a Southeast Asian country called Vietnam. A lot of people at that time couldn't figure out how a much smaller and less technologically equipped force could hold their own against a superior force like the U.S. or even why they would even try. Well, this line directly addresses that confusion, doing the Star Trek thing of couching it in allegory. Well, the subject of Vietnam gets brought up on Star Trek a couple more times, but it will never be with even this level of subtlety, believe me. But we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Now, I'm not going to comment too much on High Commission of Ferris here, since I already outlined exactly what I think of that putz in my video on Star Trek Commodores and Bureaucrats, which I linked in the description if you ain't seen it yet. And as you'll see in the video, he definitely merits some discussion. But I didn't want to spend 10 minutes repeating myself over here. So the one other thing I want to ruminate about is the role of Spock in this episode. Kind of like The Enemy Within was an examination of what makes Kirk the commander he is, Spock has to explore what he needs to be an effective commander here, too. Where we were talking about what Kirk has that makes him a commander before, here we're talking more about what Spock needs to be one, since this is his first command. Once it's over, it's clear he's got a lot to think about with regards to his future as a commander, and I think that one of the lessons he learned, aside from there are times when it's just easier to neck pinch everybody and throw them in the trunk while you get to work saving the situation, is that regardless of your actual attitudes toward logic and the right decisions, a good commander has to have empathy toward your people's points of view. You don't gotta cave to their demands, but you should at least be able to let them know that you hear them and understand their concerns. Spock wasn't a bad commander in his decision-making abilities, and he did take their wishes into consideration. After all, he let them have that stupid funeral and whatnot. But some of the pushback and vitriol could have been mitigated with better communication with his people, something Spock's logical outlook would consider unnecessary. Now that don't let Boma and McCoy off the hook, though. Those two should be spending at least a month wearing the Dingleberry hat. So there you have it, the Galileo 7. I got a little opinionated with this one, so let me know in the comments what your take on this episode was. And if you liked the review, reach down there and hit that like button so as I know you dug it. Really helps the channel out when you do that. If you haven't subscribed yet, hit the subscribe button too so you don't miss any of the excitement of watching stuff with me, Possum Rob. If you're wanting to support the channel, let me invite you to click on that join button down there. Channel membership gives you way early access to my full episode commentary tracks I'm doing for The Expanse and Babylon 5. Plus early access to anything else I come up with. And you'd be supporting the channel which I hugely appreciate. Also, we got all your possum merchandise at adstudiosmerch.com. Grab a coffee mug or a hat or something. You'll love it and you'll be supporting the channel too. Next up, Kirk may have made a decision that needlessly cost the life of an Enterprise crew member, but there's something fishy about the case against him. Is he really culpable or is he being framed? We'll find out next time in Court Martial. Until then, possum friends are awesome friends. Take it easy, all right? Later.